Welcome to Sharing Hope. My name is Jamie George. I'm your host, and our guest today is the illustrious, the wonderful Mr. Michael W. Smith. Michael is a singer, songwriter, vocalist, composer, instrumentalist. He's charted in contemporary Christian and mainstream charts. Perhaps you heard the song A Place in This World. It hit number six on the Billboard Hot 100 back in the 90s. Over the course of his career, he has starred in two films, written 14 books, and sold more than 18 million albums. He also has a killer kettleball routine. Kettlebell routine. So if you if you <laughs> if you're looking for one, ask him. Um, uh, Michael, man, I've missed you, and it's so good just to be with you over Zoom. Yeah, same here. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. So um, how, uh, how are you surviving? Are you thriving? What's the quarantine been like for you? You know what? It's actually been really good. Um, it's been good for Debbie and I. Um, it's actually really been good for all of our kids and grandkids. You know, they, you know, we had one family who didn't want to be around us for, you know, a couple months cause they were, I have Sarah's pregnant, you know, so she's scared and all that, but whatever. But, we, but we're all really, it's just been a great time. It really has been a really great time. And fortunately we live in the country and we have places to walk and things like that. So, and I've been going to my studio in the farm, but really hunkering down and finding out a lot about myself actually i i I, because you're you're pretty naturally extroverted and you get a lot of energy from being around people what what have you learned about you what is what's been interesting i think i'm an extrovert and introvert as well because i love Uh, myself too yeah Uh, yeah um i think the biggest thing that i've learned jamie is i have everything that i need i don't need it i don't need a thing Mm. i mean i mean other than Thank God in my life uh, and my family and my friends. Uh, I think maybe I've cons- uh, I see in this phase that we're in that I was consumer driven and mm. I was a busybody and just we're, we're running to and fro. Da, 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 da. And then all of a sudden that sort of comes to a halt <laughs> and, and uh, it's been peaceful. And mm. so, uh, I'm making better use of my time. Mm. And I'm creative, which is just extremely creative. Mm. So it's, you know, it's a a nice few surprises uh, in the midst of the plague or whatever you want. (laughs) Like, would you say uh, a new sense of contentment? Yeah. 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 And being, and it forces you to be still. Mm Um. Um. I think it's 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 caused me to pray more and think about other people's pain because mm. uh, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, we're sheltered, bro. You have to be honest. We are sheltered. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. a lot of people struggling out there, you know. So you start to feel people's pain, and you start to you start to have more empathy. Mm. Um, I think when we get so busy, we just lose we lose that connection with what the way that really the rest, most of the world, really most of the world, most of the world. Yeah. So operates and lives and most so many in poverty and, you know, the like list, there's, the, yeah, there's space to suddenly feel. Yeah. And when we run full exactly. sprint, yeah. When we run full sprint, it's, I, I mean, that's for me. I, I have trouble paying attention. My wife sometimes says, how are you feeling? I'm like, well, I'll tell you in three days right. how I was feeling. You know, it's, like, it's hard for me to feel it in the moment often. Right. Yeah. So I think that's been the good, that's been the healthy thing. Mm. Uh, you know, learning, learning a lot and applying that to my life. And when make, make, make a few changes here. Yeah. Um, when you, when you're creative, does that mean like, is that coming out like the, the melodies that are streaming through your mind and you doing what I've seen you do before in the studio? Or does it mean um, you're writing more or does it mean you're painting? What is, what, what is creativity when you're tapped into that? Yeah, I'm, I'm painting, you know, and I'm going on adventures and doing crazy stuff and, and maybe, maybe the world might not ever hear it. Maybe it was just meant for me, you yeah. know, um, but ex- exploring. Yeah. And, to explore and I'm not, you know, my tour's canceled or it's postponed and I'm not on a plane and I'm not going to and fro. I'm like, here I am, you know? Yeah. 
So what do I do best? What's my sweet spot? That's my sweet spot, you know? And so I've just created an atmosphere. I'm actually coming to you from my guest house. So I've got ah. my set up in my guest house, but I can also take my computer to my studio if I want to change the scenery or, uh, but I'm kind of loving this guest house thing, you know? So uh, I don't know, bro. It's hard to, I, it, it's sort of hard to, to articulate it. Um, it's very freeing. I just feel, feel very free. And, and that's a good thing. So. Can you, the, when you are tapped into that space, that space of freedom, the creativity is coming out naturally. Do you associate, to, associate that to other moments of, in your life? Or is this a relatively new feeling? Uh, I think a little bit of both. Honestly. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the good news now in this place that I'm at is I really don't care what people think for the most part, which mm. is really a great place to be. Yeah, yeah. We all want to be accepted and we all want to be appreciated. Yeah. It's part of our nature. And and really, it, it, there's only one person that's really, I mean, I'm playing for an audience of one, really. Mm. The way it really should be. So, but I, But more than any other time in my life, I'm, I really am like, I'm just at a really good place in terms of not competing and trying to, I never look at the charts. I, they let the old guy get a number one, which I had had a number one song in almost 15 years. <laughs> and uh, but I didn't really care if it went number one. All, I mean, obviously my team did, you know, yes, yes, yes. You know, and it's a song called Waymaker, you know? Um, so, but you know, I, I would have never lost any sleep if it stayed at number two and slipped back to number 10. I would not, whatever you know mm. so um i like that part about where i'm at you know obviously I, you know, we all need some work you know and and um yeah so it's just it's a it's an interesting time and i'm i'm trying not to i'm trying not to worry and i'm not really a worrier but i am concerned about our country a little bit and yeah yeah you know we're printing money like crazy and we're and in Washington and just, eh, just, oh, <laughs> you just can't, you know, you just can't watch the news all the time. Or it's no, like really no, depressing, you know? no, you can't, you can't. There has to, like, it's like there has to be, Angie and I put like, there's containers. We, you can watch it for X amount of time. Probably not before we go to bed, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I, I relate to that. So um, one of the things that's been happening that's been, and been really meaningful, I know, for a lot of other people, is you've redirected uh, some of how you've been serving people with your music by doing some some live streams, some shows. Talk a little bit about what that's been like for you and, and how people have responded. I mean, it's pretty exciting things. As, as your team has pivoted and said, well, we can't be live in a stadium, let's at least do some music this way. Right. Yeah, I, I thought, well, hey, if we, can't, if we can't go there, we'll just bring the music to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember the first week we did it was literally like right after the tour got canceled. We all gathered in my, well, five of us from the band, we all gathered in my great room and we, we, we were six feet apart. You know? <laughs> and you know, this is the, the beginning of all this happening. Right. Right. Just, we just played for an hour. We just led worship and played. And, the, and the, it was unbelievable how many people were watching. It was just incredible. And, and, you know, I finally went back because you don't have time to look at the you know, all these little things that float down the screen and things <laughs> like your head spin, you know. But I went back and 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 looked at that, and they and they just people going, "Would you please keep doing this? Please keep doing this. We need it. We need it. We need it." And then the stories and the stories, whew, blow your mind. So I felt compelled that I was supposed to do that every weekend. And then sometimes in the middle of the week, I'll just bring a message. I'll just go, Hey guys, I'm checking in on y'all. Um, I really am praying for you. Uh, uh, you know, maybe throw some scriptures and some Psalms out there, just words of encouragement. It's kind of, I kind of feel like I'm a father a little bit and, mm -hmm. and I have this platform. So it's, it's, and I feel good about that. But the, what is it about music, Jamie though? The music thing is, I still think it's the most powerful universal language in the world. And the three and a half minute song can completely change the course of somebody's life. It's yeah. extraordinary to me. Yeah. So, um, 
Oh, so we just we did it, and it's been powerful. And I've had to sort of reinvent a little bit on this. What, what's this week look like, and what's this week look like? And you know, one of my favorites that we did, we did we did a thing called the Word. It was just called the Word, and I I just literally improvised. It's the thing I wrote like three four months ago. I sat at the piano and literally just closed my eyes and I improvised for fifteen minutes. I didn't stop. I never knew where my fingers were going to go. And then I had some artists come in. Uh, There's nine artists. Uh, Joel from, for King Country, Toby Mac, Matt Marr, Amy and Darlene. Just, but every once in a while through that whole thing, we just quoted scripture. And then in the background, the vision was just, it was, it was the universe and it was nature and it was the cities and then it ended up being people at the end. Um, but it was powerful. I mean, it was mm. just powerful. And so now it's number nine and I'm getting ready to head out to the farm and Try something different. So, <laughs> I think I have an idea. Oh, um, good. Uh, I actually woke up this morning. I actually woke up this morning. It's, and I never wake up at 6.30. I, just, I try to sleep in at least till 7.30 or 8. I was wide awake at 6.25 a.m. and had the song called I'll Wait For You, uh, which is a song that I wrote. Um, and interesting that that song came to mind because lyrically it's pretty timely with with what's going on today mm-hmm. and pain and uncertainty people are feeling. So I think that'll be a part of this weekend's thing, but I'll wait for you. And, and, and if people want to tune into that, where do they find it? Where do they go? You just go to my website or you okay. can look on Facebook, Instagram, but it's mainly on Facebook and YouTube. And then it eventually goes to Instagram, but you could, if you look up on Facebook, it, it will direct you to the YouTube because it's pretty like at five o'clock on Saturday, which is tomorrow night. Okay. I don't know when that, yeah. Uh, it airs every Saturday at 5 p.m. Okay. So uncertainty. Can you go back to that for a second? Uh, it's a question I've been asking everybody, and so, and, and I'm part of it. I'm asking it for me. So many of us are feeling the weight of the uncertainty. Every everything has changed so much. Can you go back to a time in your story where you felt a similar weight? That that I, I really have no idea where things are going to go. How did you get through it, and how did it change you? Well, I think the bit, golly, I'm sure there's just, I'm, I'm sure there's hundreds of those times of, of feeling a little lost and uncertain. You know, but, but my, uh, I recollect for some reason back to when I, not 1979, when I almost died, really, probably, you know. From what? From a near drug overdose. Wow. Snorted something that I thought was something else. I was just a mess from 75 to 79, and I thought I was going to die. I mean, I, I probably should have gone to the hospital, and um, that, that's a whole other story in itself. And that's, what, that's when I realized that if something didn't change, that I was going to lose my life. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was not my destiny. Mm-hmm. There was a call of God on my life. And and so I began to pray all these crazy prayers, you know, God, get my attention. I need whatever you have to do. Cause I was completely in a pit and no ladder to get out. I'd say that's pretty uncertain. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You die, you know, yeah. making these, hanging out with the wrong people and making bad choices. And then, um, and then all that uncertainty ended one night on my linoleum floor in my apartment in Nashville, Tennessee, when I had a, I guess I had a nervous breakdown and, and I convulsed and wept for three and a half hours, from midnight till three thirty in the morning. And then all of a sudden, just kind of like right out of a sci-fi movie or out of some crazy movie that all of a sudden just a hush came over the apartment. And I just felt like the Abba father, just put his arm around me going, I got, I got you. I got this. And I haven't been the same since mm. it's turned at that point, but all so much uncertainty during that crazy time of just doing stupid things mm. that could have cost me my life. Yeah. Was and it? Could, you know, could, if that didn't happen. There wouldn't have been a Debbie and there wouldn't have been a right. Right. It's, cra- it's just, it's, crazy to think of the history and how God has protected us and, and how he allows certain things to happen and why bad things happen and why did this happen? And, ugh, just 
a lot of I have more questions than I do have answers, but yeah, faith has never been higher at the same time. For for someone who's in that space, who who's maybe looking at their life and going, I I I might resonate with what Michael's saying that I I think there is something I'm meant to do on this planet. I think maybe there is a call, there is something, but I'm I'm stuck, I'm broken, I'm confused, I'm disoriented. Would you say, would your encouragement to them be similar to your experience? Like it's ultimately about surrender. Like it's it's a fully giving everything. I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> At the be- end because, yeah, what you were describing is it wasn't like, hey, God, let's negotiate. I'll do this. You do this. Some kind of karmic transition or transaction. You're going, no, I, like, I'm, I'm going to literally, you're trustworthy or you're not. I'm handing you my life. Exactly. It's either true or not. Yeah, it's true or not. Yeah. When, when you, as you've lived that out and you hit these other spaces of uncertainty, whether it's just being a dad for a bunch of kids, whether it's in your career, do you go back to that moment of surrender or, or are there other practices that you now lean into that, that pull you through without spinning you out? Like what, what, what do you do now when you deal with levels of uncertainty? I more than anything, I just make myself go, uh, meditate on the promises of God. You know, I mean, there's still those those days you, you wake up and you feel funky and you feel lost. And, you go, and even to this day, there are the days that come that go, man, I have no idea what's going on. And I feel completely lost. It's mm. crazy. Mm. So when I hit those times, I just make myself go. I hit all those. I hit all my faves, you know. Uh, you know, I came to give you whatever. But plans to prosper do not harm you. You know, my Psalm one thirty nine. You know, how precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? How vast is the sum of them? If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. You know, all these things that 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 really so eloquently in Scripture tells me how God feels about me, mm. and how so easy that you forget that. You know, when you're in the heat of the battle or in, or you're in some sort of trial. You know. Um, so I think I just do that. I think I just, cause either those promises are true or they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I believe they are. So you just have to, it's a, you just have to, it's like a fresh reminder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you used the phrase earlier, Abba father, which I, I mean, the first person I heard use that most eloquently was Brennan Manning, who I know was a friend of yours. Um, it feels like, and, and knowing you through the years, it feels like a warm, like go, even going back to the Psalms and leaning into those, those promises, and you use the metaphor of a father, it almost feels like you are leaning into God like a dad, like there is that level of closeness. Do you feel that with God? Do you feel a sense of like, there's a warm relationship? This is not a distant, abstract theology for me? it feels the way, you know, some days it doesn't. Um, and I don't know why, but I would say most of the time it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful relationship. You know, and, I compare it kind of like, the, like me and my dad. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. I was going to say you, you had the advantage of having actually a warm fatherly yeah. relationship. So yeah. it, does it have some similarities to that for you at times? It does a lot actually. Yeah. And I talk about my dad in concert a lot, especially towards the end, just how he kind of really showed me what God was like in some ways. I mean, he had his faults. I didn't see very many of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, uh, he was for me my whole life. My dad mm. was um, crazy. Here's, here's just an example. It was a crazy story. Really, it really did happen. True story. He, you know, my dad had dementia and he still knew who I was and he had taken a fall and, you know, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but, um, hold the phone. You ever heard the hold the phone story? I don't think so. My dad had all these sayings. You know, he came from that great generation, you know, like, uh, you know, when you were sick, you went to work. 
with the work, you know, and it was that work ethic and you, right. you loved your family and you loved your community, you loved your church, you know, just that whole thing, just get, giving back to the community and everybody knew, you know, my, 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 that's my mom and dad's reputation. Just they're the most amazing people. And he'd have these sayings like, you know, what in the wide world of sports is going on. Hold the phone, which means I got something to say. Hold the phone. So whatever. Long story short, he was – he'd fallen. I, we thought he was going to die, and I was at the house with mom. It was just awful. It was just – and he turned completely white. And and so they – the long story short, they put him on a stretcher. They take him. They put him in the ambulance, this big ambulance. And and I'm thinking we're going to the hospital. They, we don't go anywhere. They're working on my dad in the back of that ambulance. In the meantime, it's like 15 people come out and fill stone for so loving on my mom these guys walk work on my dad and about less than 10 minutes later the color starts coming back into my dad's skin i think he's going to make it you know so i turn to go greet all these amazing people loving on my mom and then all of a sudden i hear my dad say hold the phone and it was like hold the phone hold the phone hold the phone he's shouting and i run back to that ambulance and every paramedic was like Nobody's moving. And I, I promise you, Jamie, my dad leans his head off that stretcher and says, do y'all know who that is out there? That's, that's my son. <laughs> Michael W. Smith. <laughs> hold the phone. Oh, hold the phone. Oh, and my gosh. You're going, McFly, oh, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and then. I had, and then Jamie, it was literally 10, 15, 10 as I was starting to, because these guys were laughing too, and I don't know if these paramedics even knew who I was. My dad wanted to make sure they knew who I was. <laughs> They're like, Michael, who, what, what? And literally, it was 10 seconds later, maybe 15 seconds, and all of a sudden, I just, I heard a voice. I don't know if it was audible, but it, it, it very well could have been. I just, I really heard God say, that's how I feel about you. Oh, gosh. And it wiped me out. My knees buckled. I almost kind of, I almost had to sit down. Gosh. Swelled up with tears. And, mm. and uh, yeah, so I love telling that story because I, re- I really do believe that's who he is. Mm. That, that, it, yeah, because healthy parents adore their children. Yeah. And, and, and if we can somehow eject from some of our Zeus-like images of God and come yep. back to that fatherly picture, um, I, I, I so appreciate you bringing that up because <clears throat> as I sit and talk with people, who some who've had great relationships with their parents and some who haven't, we've often had to talk about how do you how do you trust in a God that you can't see? And you're usually creating associations with some other authority figure in your life. You've had the benefit of, of having a loving father who adored you. So you get to see it through that lens. When you're with people who come from really broken places and go, Michael, I'm stuck. I just, how could it be true that God loves me this much? What do you say to them? How, how do you encourage... And, and, and I know just in the church you're involved in, there's so many folks that just come in that broken space. And what are words of encouragement if they go, I don't have a frame of reference on earth. How do I find it? All I know is if you didn't have a good dad, I know God can father you. Mm. Uh, because I've seen it happen with a lot of amazing people in my life. Don Finto had an awful childhood. My mom, I'll give an example about my mom. My mom... She was eight years old, and her young two sisters, D and Pat, five and six, and my uncle Bill, four, four of them. My real grandmother was one block from their house, very abusive mother, and she said, "Get out of the car. You're walking. You're walking the rest of the way home." It was just a block. My real grandmother took off, and she never ever came back. Whoa! Never came back. Whoa! And at some point in my mom's Early, early teens, she just, I think she had some sort of encounter with God and she just kind of made this commitment going, you know what, I'm not, that's not ever going to happen to my kids. Mm. My mom's just, she's just amazing 
human being. She's mm-hmm. just incredible, but she has every right to be bitter for the rest of her life. But she's she, chosen not to be, and she hasn't lived a lifetime that way. But I, I'm not going to let. I'm not going to let that define me. Mm. Mm. I mean, she and, never she didn't. And would you say that, uh, I'm thinking some of our mutual friends, if you seek him, you will find him. You will find him. And whether you know it or not, he's after you. Like, you know, my friend Brian says, he, you know, he's always, always quoting that old poem, the hound of heaven. Like, I mean, like he is in pursuit right. if you'll just see it. Um, so, so we got to wrap up our, our time's running out. Uh, what do you, is there anything right now that, um, matters more now than it did before the quarantine that you go, this, this didn't matter that much, but now it kind of matters a lot to me. Um, I think probably, Jamie, probably, um, I think two words come to mind, rest and still. Mm. Um, I'm like you in some ways, you know, just, <laughs> we're just with the bunny rabbit, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, just, that is it. And just. Uh, yes, I've been convicted listening to you. I'm already like, oh, okay, <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> slow down. <laughs> Value the uh, the perks that come. The perks. I say perks. I don't know why I choose that word. The perks that come with really being still mm-hmm. and 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 I think there's and, and I think maybe I, I'm starting to really see the benefits of it. You know, in these last two months of something stirring inside of me that maybe never would have happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had not been somewhat forced into quarantine or whatever. Yes, yes. So it really does make you view things a lot different and it makes you reevaluate a lot of things. Yeah. You know, I'm more grateful probably. Yeah. Than I was grateful anyway. Hmm. I'm even more grateful. So it's almost like it drops into your bones, like at this deeper knowing. Yeah. Cause I know when I take the time for silence, I'm always transformed. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm sure that's part of the reason I'm often distracted to keep me from that space. <laughs> oh gosh. I'm already like, Oh, when I get done with Michael, I have a little prayer time. <laughs> um, so thank you, my friend. Um, be with you. It's so good to be with you. And, um, and, and again, I just want to say to folks it, it, who are, who need the hope we were talking about, it, it, go to Michael W. Smith, Facebook. That's the easiest place to find. Um, find stuff to be able to follow you and catch up with what's going on in your life. All right. Is that right? Okay. I'm sorry for the lawnmower outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end. All right. Love you, my friend. Say hi to Deb for me. I'll do it. So good Love to see you. you.